Hi all, welcome to today's session. As you as you were seeing that we were dealing with uh, some deviations from Mendelian genetics. So today I have come with such a concept named pleiotropy. This will be a new concept for all of you, I think. Concept name again, pleiotropy. Pleiotropy. It's very simple. One gene showing many effects. Now what is that? So far we have learned that every character in our body is controlled by a gene. One gene controls one particular character. Right? But today we are going to learn about a concept which is entirely new for you all. That is one gene showing control over many characters or many traits or one gene performing many effects in the body of an organism. Let's go back to the pea plant itself. Okay, here we are taking one gene which is controlling as I have told you more than one effects. So those effects are the starch grain synthesis in pea plant, the, the, the amount of starch grain synthesized, the size of the starch grain and the shape of the seed. So we are taking three aspects, three effects and all these three effects are controlled by one gene. Okay, so that is pleiotropy. It is very simple. Pleiotropy means one gene controlling many effects. So such a gene, you call them as pleiotropic gene. So what a pleiotropic gene is? A gene which is able to control more than one effect is termed as pleiotropic gene. Got it? Fine. Let's move on to the example so that it will be more clear to you. So here I have taken that there is a gene which is controlling three aspects. The amount of starch synthesized, the shape of the starch grain and the, and the size of the starch grain. Okay. So here the gene has having two alleles, capital B, capital B and small b, small b. Two alleles, capital B and small b. So if it is homozygous, capital B, capital B, then the amount of starch synthesized is very high. That is what is written. If capital B, capital B, then the amount is very high. That means it is able to efficiently synthesize the starch. And so, what about the size? Size will be very large. Okay. Now what about the shape? It will have a round shape. So this part is clear I think. If the alleles are both homozygous, capital B, capital B, then what are the effects on these three aspects or these three phenotypes that we have taken? Synthesis, large amount, that is it is efficiently synthesized. So the seed size will be large and shape will be round. Now let us move on to the next aspect. If both are recessive, small b, small b, then what about the amount, less amount of starch is synthesized? So naturally the seed will be small in size, shape is wrinkled, shape is wrinkled. Now combination, heterozygous condition, capital B, small b. Okay, what this homozygous, heterozygous and all I have already dealt with in the previous videos. So Please subscribe my channel so that you have, can have a clear understanding of all these aspects of the terms like homozygous, heterozygous and all. Welcome back. See here, if it is heterozygous condition, capital B, small b, then the amount produced is intermediate. Size also will be intermediate. Intermediate means neither too large nor too small. It will be in between. Okay, since Capital B, small b, if the two alleles are combining in a combination and if you get a heterozygous combination, the amount of starch synthesized will be intermediate. Their size also will be intermediate. But what about the shape? Shape will be round. So what is the inference from this? When you take the case of shape, we will take the case of shape, 
the dominant capital B here is dominant, isn't it? That is why if you take capital B small b, capital B is able to suppress the expression of small b. So the seed is round, not wrinkled. Small b is having no role here when shape is considered. But when you move on to the other two aspects, that is size and amount of starch grain synthesized, capital B and small b is coming here. Capital B is trying to express, small b is also trying to express, but not completely. You are not getting a large size uh, and efficiently produced starch grain, nor you are getting a very small or less efficiently produced starch grain but you are getting something in between so here is the concept of incomplete dominance this is a clear thing so here one gene is showing many effects effects on synthesis effects on size effects on shape but when you take the phenotypes differently phenotypes means you are taking the shape and the size and amount differently, it is showing two different aspects of dominance. In one case, it is completely blending with the Mendelian principles if you take the shape, but if you take the size, it is not showing Mendelian principle, but it is deviating from it and it is showing incomplete dominance. So this is a classic example and it's a very good example for you when it's in the exams when it is asked, an example to show a gene which is showing both Mendelian principles as well as deviating from Mendelian principle, you can take example of starch grain synthesis in pea plant and take three aspects that is synthesis amount, size and shape. Shape is considered, it is going with the Mendel's principles but when the amount and size is considered, it is going away and it is going towards incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance is a phenomena where the alleles are not able to dominate completely or not able to suppress each other completely but both are expressed but not completely. Alleles are expressed but not completely and this is a clear understanding of one gene showing many effect that is pleiotropy. So this example I have taken for in the case of plants. Let me take another example in the case of human beings itself and make it more clear to you. I hope this part is clear. Okay, so we are moving again to pleiotropy, one gene, many effect and uh, this time let us take example of an example from the human body itself and in that example <coughs> I am taking you towards a disease, name of a disease. The name of the disease is phenylketonuria. I think for someone it is, uh, it, uh, you are hearing it as something, I am saying it is Greek and Latin. Don't worry, it is a very simple name. I will make it very clear to you. Phenylketonuria. Phenylketonuria. Okay, phenylketonuria. This is a disease. This is not a gene. This is a disease. Let us see what that disease is first. <laughs> then I will move on to the gene aspect. Okay. In this disease what happens is the, uh, the amino acid phenylalanine. You know there are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Among that one amino acid is phenylalanine. Now if you want to know what is amino acid, amino acids are simply the building blocks of proteins or proteins are made up of amino acids. There are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Among that one amino acid is phenylalanine. Okay. This phenylalanine is converted to another amino acid called tyrosine. So phenylalanine converted to tyrosine. For this conversion an enzyme is required. 
द नेम ऑफ द एंजाइम इज फीनाइल एलानिन hydroxylase just a minute okay fine welcome back phenyl alanine hydroxylase okay so for the conversion of the enza so amino acid phenyl alanine to another amino acid tyrosine our body requires an enzyme called phenyl alanine hydroxylase this is a normal metabolic process occurring inside human body there are many conversions taking place inside human body when you eat your food it is converted to glucose and you get energy right there are many steps many enzymes involved in that process similarly this is another process in phenylalanine getting converted to tyrosine for that what is required an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase is required okay now comes our point this enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is synthesized by a gene this gene is responsible for the production of this enzyme and only if this enzyme is present this conversion will take place in the disease called phenylketonuria the patient doesn't have this gene or the patient is having a modified gene or the patient is having a non functional gene or i can say the patient is having a gene mutation the word mutation is coming mutation means sudden inheritable changes in genes sudden inheritable changes in genes so here a normal gene will produce phenyl alanine hydroxylase and this normal conversion will take place so no problem in the in the body of the of a human being but when there occurs mutation in this gene this gene is not able to produce this enzyme and when this gene is not able to produce this enzyme this conversion will not happen then what will happen if this conversion doesn't happen then what is happening then if this gene is not produced i'm writing this case here phenylalanine will be converted to phenyl pyruvic acid an acid phenylalanine amino acid will be converted to an acid what is the name of the acid phenyl pyruvic acid now this is very dangerous this phenyl not only phenyl pyruvic acid children plus some other derivatives also will come other products that is other derivatives so if this gene is absent if this gene is absent what will happen this enzyme is not produced so this process cannot occur so another process takes place what is that phenylalanine is converted to phenyl pyruvic acid and some other derivatives will be formed now this i told is highly dangerous accumulation of this derivatives and this phenyl pyruvic acid inside our brain results in results in mental retardation mental retardation what will result in mental retardation accumulation of this why this not accumulated because phenylalanine is converted to phenyl pyruvic acid why this conversion because this enzyme is not produced why this enzyme is not produced because this gene has undergone a mutation so this gene when it is undergoing a mutation it will lead to a disease called as phenyl ketonuria and is accumulation of phenyl pyruvic acid this phenyl pyruvic acid cannot be absorbed by kidneys also so it will be excreted out through the urine that is why the urea ketone urea phenyl ketone urea it will be excreted out through the urine so if it is accumulated in our brain it will be definitely accumulated in the brain so what will happen <coughs> it will lead to mental retardation this is one effect that the absence of this gene is causing 
another effect it will lead to hair loss so two things connected with our head one is mental retardation another thing is hair loss and the third one it will also reduce the skin pigmentation so three effects are there three phenotypic effects which are the mental retardation hair loss and loss in uh, skin pigmentation so one gene gene responsible for the production of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase if that is absent that will lead to the accumulation of phenylpyruvic acid and it will result in three different phenotypic effects so this is also another example of pleiotropy so i hope pleiotropy is clear to you that's three white pleiotropy is very simple it is the phenomena of one gene producing many effects such genes which produce many effects are called as pleiotropic gene so one classic example is the disease phenylketonuria caused due to the absence of a gene which is responsible for the production of phenylalanine hydroxylase absence of this enzyme will not allow the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine so it will lead to accumulation of some other products which results in mental retardation hair loss and loss in skin pigmentation so i hope this part is very clear to you he this i have told you one gene many effect in the next video i will come with many genes showing the same effect so wait for that thank you for now